Our scripture reading today is from Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. and He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Over the last couple of weeks, uh, we've heard two different missionaries come and speak to us. Two weeks ago, it was Donnie Todd. He's with the Center for Mission Mobilization. And uh, he came in and he just shared with us um, about God's heart for the nations. Um, He shared with us that there are almost three billion people in this world um, who don't have consistent access to the Bible or to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, Last week, Devin... Uh, she talked to us and about her ministry on college campuses with Stumo, um, and it, just to hear how God is using her, it's profound and it's encouraging. Um, and we should be hopeful people in this world because Jesus didn't just call us to go, but rather He says, "I'm with you, even to the very end of the age." And so uh, we can be an in- encouraged. In that, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, he said to his disciples, those that is hearing, he says, you're going to be my witnesses. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you're going to be my witnesses. You're going to have power in the midst of ministry and mission. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. And so we've heard about God's heart for the nations We've heard about how God has been working through Devin and Stumo. And and the question that I want to ask is, what about us? What is our role in God's mission as the church of Jesus Christ, as cross-community church, as individual believers? what What is our part in taking the gospel to the nations and being missionaries, if you will, for Jesus Christ? Well, there are two pieces to mission uh, that I want to address for you this morning. Um, The first is the personal component of mission. And and what that means is that every single one of us, as individual members of the body of Christ, uh, believers in Jesus, those who would call ourselves Christians or disciples, uh, we have an important role to play in God's Mission. So again, the uh, personal component of missions is the individual life of missions that's lived out by every believer in, at any time and in any place. And I, I want to stress that this is a really, really important component of missions. Uh, when I was a little kid, I assumed that missions was what happened when you sent the quirky older guy overseas to to take a bunch of slides that he would come back and share with the church, right? That was what missions was. And to be honest with you, I didn't want to be a missionary. That guy generally wasn't all that well-spoken, although he had seen some cool things and wore some interesting clothes. I wasn't all that interested in it, right? I thought, you know, missions, maybe not for me. I'm going to go do something else. But to think that God in His sovereignty has created you and me exactly the way that we were created, with the gifts and the talents and the aptitudes and the abilities that we have. And He has seen fit to place us in this place at this time in our neighborhood, among our friends and relatives and co-workers. He has seen fit to say of all the people He's ever created, He has chosen you to walk in the circle that you walk in, live in the house that you live in, to have kids that play the sports that they, that they play, that you're going to sit next to the people that you're going to sit next to. God has done that intentionally. And He has prepared good works for us that we might walk in those things And the primary way that we will honor and glorify God, walk in those good works, is by being a faithful witness wherever we find ourselves. I want to remind us, and we need to be reminded, that we are the church, and not not just we collectively. We are the church when we gather here on Sundays, but we are the church here in about, you know, 45 minutes when we leave this place and we go out of here. The church is going to be scattered all across our city and our community. And we just as much need to be the church when we leave here as we are when we're gathered here. This has been a few years ago. I had a a man, he came into my office, and uh, normally when people want to meet with me, it's not like, hey, man, my life is so good. Can I just tell you how God is working in my life? And so this man, he came in, he was a little bit upset, 
and he begins to tell me this story that had really upset him, and I couldn't figure out why he was upset at first. And he said, okay, so last week I'm driving down the road, and it's raining, and it's cold, and I see this guy, and he's out walking on the highway. I'm like, okay, that sounds a little tragic, you know. He said, so uh, I couldn't just leave him there, and so I turned around, and I pull up, and I, I picked him up. And I took him down to a little restaurant down here, and I you know, got him in a place that was warm, and I got him some food. And I found out he was really lonely, and he was hungry. And so I got him some food, and I spent about an hour with him, and then he you know, was ready to go on his way. And I'm like, this sounds great, you know? Like, what's he possibly upset about? And he said, um, we have children's ministry, and we have student ministry, and we send missionaries to China what is our church doing about people like that? We're doing missions all over the world, but what are we doing in our own backyard? And I said to him, it seems like we're doing a pretty good job. And he was like, well, what's our church going to do for a guy like that? I'm like, you are our church. And it sounds like you found, found a guy that was cold and hungry and lonely and you brought him to a warm place and you gave him a meal and you spent time with him. That sounds like exactly what we're supposed to be. Now, that misunderstanding resulted because he thought that in order for there to, to the church to be ministering to people, you need, you need a committee or something, right? you got to get some heads together. we got to talk about this a lot. We need to have a, a budget and a leader. And listen, the vast majority of what's going to happen mission-wise among any of God's people is going to look just like that. It's that story with different names and different circumstances told over and over and over as the church of Jesus Christ, wherever we might find ourselves, chooses to step into the need that God brings across our path, choose to meet those needs and to share the love of Jesus Christ right in the midst of that. Y'all, we, we can't possibly have a ministry for everything. We don't have enough money and we don't have enough people, right? We'd be all exhausted and worn out. But if we'll be the church of Jesus Christ and we'll step into those opportunities that we see to bring the love of Christ in any moment that it's ultimately that we see that would be needed, what happens when we leave here is every week we commission five to six hundred missionaries that leave this building and they fill restaurants. And you enter into your neighborhood. They're going to interact with your family. And if we see ourselves as missionaries, then that story it happens over and over and over and over again. And the needs that are met, we probably couldn't describe, you know, in a, in a single worship service on Sunday. And so I want to bring to attention this personal component of missions. Um, if you call yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ, He has called you to go and to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded you. So many of you, um, last night, you were there. You served at the Fall Roundup, and man, it was awesome. I want to say thank you, by the way, to everyone who served. It's kind of exhausting. It's a lot exhausting. Uh, but man, what God does there is just extraordinary. Uh, some of you uh, picked up the ball or the ring for the ring toss 10,000 times or cooked more food than you would ever want to cook, but I just want to say thank you for stepping into that. And, and, and there were a lot of things that happened at the fall roundup with a few, I don't know, a thousand or so people show up uh, that, that aren't necessarily quantified in terms of the number of games and food and all that that we did. Uh, but it's personal conversations, people that were prayed for, people that were listened to. And so even in the midst of something we would do corporately, there is a, a very personal component to missions where we offer ourselves in any given moment to the people who are around us. Now, some people would say, um, hey, that stuff you talked about, you know, like helping people, you know, stranded on the side of the road or, or whatever, isn't that what the church staff is for? And I would say, um, no, absolutely not. Now, hopefully our church staff are going to be willing to do those sorts of things. But in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul tells us uh, the role of, of your staff and your leaders in churches. It says this, in Ephesians 4.11, he says, And he gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers, and here's why he gave them. He has given those people to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And so uh, our role as staff and leaders in this church is not to do all the ministry, although we certainly should do our part. 
um, but rather our role is to equip this body rather than sending out, you know, five or six or seven or, you know, however possibly many staff we could afford here. Uh, we would rather use our staff to equip the saints for the work of ministry and instead send out five to six hundred missionaries into every place of business and every school and every neighborhood throughout our community. So again, I want to highlight the personal component of missions, um, but that's not the only. There is the corporate uh, component, and that, that component is the missions that we participate in together as a local body of believers. Um, Acts chapter 13, um, I, I don't know, maybe if you're not, if you don't serve like vocationally in the church, maybe this doesn't hit you as much, uh, but maybe it does. If you've ever sat in a church and you've heard a really great preacher versus a mediocre preacher, you've probably felt some of this. So here's what's happening in the church at Antioch. Um, you have like the A team of guys that are serving there. You got the Apostle Paul, who, my goodness, uh, he can preach. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, uh, you know, endless knowledge. He, you know, he saw Jesus. He knocked him off the horse. I mean, Paul has had some experiences, right? Extraordinary illustrations in every sermon about things that he's endured. He's great. And then you have Barnabas who's the encourager, and you can't wait to see that guy because you walk in the door and he makes you feel like a million bucks, like he's a, a gifted guy. So we read here in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger. You have Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. It's good to have highly connected people, right? He knows Herod, you know what I mean? You get a traffic ticket, you know to call. So that, these people are all in the church, and, and Saul was there. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, maybe they'd gathered for something like this. The Holy Spirit said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. And after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them, and they sent them off. And this wasn't for an errand. And this was, this was years of separation. The Apostle Paul would never get to spend uh, a substantial amount of time at Antioch again. They just sent out their best and their brightest. And the church felt that. One of the things that we do corporately as a church to do missions together is by sending people out. Uh, sending people out on mission. Sometimes they're our best and our brightest. Sometimes we don't uh, get to know them as well. But one of the ways that we cooperate as a body to do missions corporately is by sending people. I mean, the church at Antioch, they probably would have sent them with some money. Like somebody else had to preach, and there would have had to been someone else step up to the plate to be the encourager, right? So the church felt a sense of loss, but they did it, that the gospel might be taken to the nations. And my goodness, Barnabas and Saul, um, they did it. Right? So that's one of the ways that we'll do corporate missions. Another way is through giving together. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, but he's actually calling out another church uh, that was really giving uh, beyond their means. It says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. It says, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction. Y'all, this wasn't everything's blowing up and, you know, stock markets on the rise and businesses are thriving, but in the midst of a severe test of affliction, the church at Macedonia, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in, in a wealth of generosity on their part. These people who had nothing in the midst of poverty and their joy for the Lord Jesus Christ has overflowed into extreme generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. And so the church at Macedonia, um, they're giving sacrificially, even in the midst of poverty, to fund the work of missions. This would have been Saul. This would have been giving money to churches who found themselves in need. In the midst of famine, they would help others out. And so we'll um, corporately do missions by sending out uh, missionaries. We'll do it by giving money to people that ultimately might be in need. And then we'll do it by the cooperative efforts like we did last night at the Roundup where we all come together and uh, we publicly do some sort of mission work together. And so today I wanted to, to share with you some of the ways that we do missions corporately as a church. Now, um, 
I want you to keep going. Keep doing your personal mission to the glory of God. We pray that our community is so impacted by the gospel that someday we'll be like, ah, man, we... I don't know who else to share with. Like, everybody knows Jesus, right? But we're not there yet. So just keep going. Keep serving personally. But here are some of the things that we're doing corporately. All right? As a church, we break down our mission efforts into three categories. Uh, Local missions, North American missions, and then our international stuff. So local missions. Last night we did the fall roundup. That would be a part of that. We spend a bunch of money and a heck of a lot of time and energy uh, to put that on. And we do it uh, that our community might see the love of Jesus Christ in action. And we might get to speak the gospel to people that aren't going to come inside the doors of this church. So that's one of the things we do. Uh, Another thing that we do as a church is our giving ministry. Uh, This year, we have spent over $30,000 tangibly. Yeah, amen. (laughs) Trying to meet the needs of people in our community. And so uh, it's going to be people who are in need of food. Or people who are, are needing help, we help a lot with the foster care system through the care portal where uh, Claire got up and told you last week about a young man that we got to help him have clothes, uh, you know, one of the coldest days of the year, and he had flip-flops. And so we have spent over $30,000 this year investing into our local community, meeting tangible needs that come across our path. And uh, thank you guys that give to that, that enable us to do such a thing. Another way that we support missions locally, we actually partner with First Baptist Church of Poto to support Carlos Aguilar. He's the pastor of House of Restoration. It's a Spanish language church in our city, and so there's something profound about being able to worship in your heart language. We've got a lot of Spanish speakers here, and Carlos Aguilar, he's been at it over 10 years uh, leading a Spanish language church, and God's doing great things in their midst. Another way uh, that we support missions locally is through our coffee bar. Y'all, y'all we're doing an AMA series next week. We're going to start that for one month, and it's just the questions that you guys have submitted. And one of the questions we got, uh, someone, I think it was like kind of a zinger, you know, I, if it was you, I'm not mad. I'm just going to answer it. Uh, they said, uh, hey, if Jesus went into the temple and saw the money changers, and he got angry, and he turned over the temple, or, or turned over their tables, and he ran them out of the temple with whips, why do we have a coffee bar in our church? Ooh, you know, that's a fair thing to think about, right? Um, two reasons we have coffee bar in the church. Number one is hospitality, that when people come in here, we get to give them a free cup of coffee and say, hey, come and be a part of us, right? We get to enjoy that together. The second thing is that we don't make any money through the coffee bar. As a matter of fact, every cup of coffee that you buy, the profit that we make in there, it goes to support local missions. Uh, one of those things is second chances. Terry and Chewy Sanchez, I think they're going to be up here on the screen. We have their, their picture Uh, They serve at Second Chances. It's a recovery ministry that also meets a tremendous amount of needs from uh, helping people with electric bills to finding jobs to getting clothes to where to work. uh, Vast and broad ministry. And so we give to them every single month. And then we also support Recovery Ranch, otherwise known as 633 with Kane Riggs. uh, Men going out there and having their lives changed. Y'all, that's not just us giving mission to help needs. Those are discipleship sort of ministries that we get to fund every week through our coffee bar. And so unapologetically, we're going to charge you your money for your coffee and your soda, and we're going to celebrate every time you overindulge because we get to send a heck of a lot of money to missions through that. So to all of you who are sipping coffee right now, thumbs up. You're doing awesome, all right? The final way that we support local missions as a church is through the Baptist Collegiate Ministry. Got a couple of students down here in the front serving at the BCM here, and that's just our ministry to college kids uh, here at Carl Albert State College. Uh, Wonderful ministry. People are being trained up and discipled in what is a difficult time of life, and so we support them every single month, and we're thankful to be able to do that. So those are just some of the ways that we as a church invest locally here in our community Uh, to do missions. Um, And then we do North American stuff. Um, Devin Huddleston, um, who you heard from last week with STUMO, uh, that's an organization that's that's trying to be on every college campus in America. They're primarily here in the Midwest, but they are expanding. Um, They want to make disciples of college students. So that's one of the people that we invest in. We support Devin every single month and her work with STUMO. Uh, We also support the North American Mission Board. If you're not an old school Baptist, you may not know what that is. Uh, But we are a Baptist church here. Uh, No apologies for that. But uh, basically, uh, the Baptists, we cooperate together to do missions 
uh, both here and abroad. And so North American Mission Board, uh, basically churches from all over the U.S. compile their money to support missionaries here. Last year alone, they planted 857 churches. And many of those places where Christianity is profoundly on the decline or disappearing. And so they go to difficult places and difficult cities and begin to plant churches that, uh, in, in hopes that the gospel will continue to, to grow and to thrive in those places. So if you have questions about that, we can talk later. I got a really great report <clears throat> over the past, I don't know, seven or eight years, uh, we had the opportunity to, to support Free City Church. Uh, Casey Maddox, I think we have his picture up here as well. Uh, he came to us a number of years ago and was like, hey, I'm going to plant a church in Lawrence, Kansas. That's where uh, Kansas University is located. And uh, he began, he began working there. And God has blessed their church to, to the point that a few years ago, he's like, hey, we don't need your support anymore. So church has been birthed in that city, and God has done an extraordinary work. But I got to talk to him this week, and he said, man, I have some great news for you and your church. He said, uh, not only is our church doing well, but uh, coming next year, we're going to plant our first church in Topeka, Kansas as well. And so you see like generations of, of churches being born, and that's because we were able to sow into that ministry and to, to give uh, financially uh, to them. And so that's just a, a great joy for me. Another way that we've done missions in North America, we sent almost 40 people to West Virginia uh, this past year. Many of you got to go, and uh, it, it is a difficult place. It's not an easy trip to go on. They sleep on cots, and you take cold showers every day. Uh, but it's uh, one of the most, if not the most, impoverished counties in the United States. Uh, drug overdose deaths are through the roof, and so we get to go and take the love of Jesus Christ there. There's actually a church that our group served this year uh, that they didn't have any men in their church, like no men. I think they had one guy, uh, and they're like, we need some help with the roof, and our people were able to go and to serve, students and adults alike, to go uh, put a new roof on that church. We got to do a block party and share the hope of Jesus Christ with a whole lot of people um, that otherwise don't have much hope, and so again, that's kind of one of the ways that we do missions here in North America. Now, the final piece that I wanted to share with you about is how we do missions internationally, and that's just around the world. Um, like the North American Mission Board, we also give money to the International Mission Board, which uh, supports about 3,500 missionaries around the globe, many of those people in very difficult places. Uh, several years ago, when we sent Carrie Miller to East Asia, we uh, did so with the help of the International Mission Board to place her uh, in a difficult place among a people uh, that did not have anyone taking the gospel to them. Uh, another one that we've supported in the past, uh, David Taylor. He's uh, the pastor of the church in Turkey that we were able to give a, a good sum of money to. He was uh, basically seeking to purchase the facility that they were using uh, over there for their church. Uh, he was able to buy that facility. He was able to gain his citizenship. And I got to hear a story about him this week. Um, Y'all know the war has broken out in Ukraine. Russia has come and invaded. And there were tons and tons and tons of refugees. And um, David had been uh, just, just kind of praying, like, God, what would you have us do? You know, uh, in Turkey, they don't have a tremendous amount of resources, although they're fully funded and don't need our support anymore. Uh, they didn't have a ton of resources, but he's like, God, would you just send us anyone that you would want to send us that we could care for them? And about the same time, there was a man in Ukraine who was a believer, and he was on his knees and he was praying. He's saying, God, where am I going to find a church that can encourage me? You know, I'm going to go to another country, and another place. I'm not sure where I'm going to wind up. But would you send me somewhere uh, where I can have a church that I can connect with? And that night as that Ukrainian man uh, went to sleep, he had a dream. And he had a dream about um, a pastor in Turkey that greeted him with open arms. And he said it just gave him peace that God was going to lead him where he needed to be. Well, a few weeks later, this man finds himself in Fethiye, Turkey, and he's asking people, is there a Christian church here? And everyone says, oh yeah, you need to meet David Taylor, it's right over here. And he walked in the doors of the church that you guys helped purchase, the building, and he looks and he sees David Taylor, and he says, I got to tell you, he said, uh, I saw you in my dream, like God has led me here. 
thank you for being faithful. And David's like, well, I've been praying for you too, so welcome. And so God's done a remarkable work there in Turkey. Uh, as I said, they don't, they're, they're funded. They don't need our help anymore, but we got to be a little part of what God is doing in a, in a church in a very, very difficult place. And so i uh, very excited about that. We support Rhonda Baxter, who uh, did live here, has been a part of this church for 20-something years. Uh, she recently moved to Broken Arrow area with her children, but she's a regional care coordinator for Global Outreach International, where she just cares for missionaries. If, if you've ever gone uh, overseas or been connected to someone who does, there is an extraordinary amount of health issues, of cultural stress that you face, and all of those missionaries need people to care for them, to pray with them, to help them in the midst of their needs. And that's what Rhonda does all across the whole European theater for um, Global Missions International. And so uh, a, a great thing that we get to support uh, there's also another couple that we don't mention their name from the stage. Um, they're out there in the coffee bar. You can read their names, but they serve in a, a closed country in North Africa. A young couple uh, that love the Lord. They take the gospel to Muslim peoples, and uh, it's a difficult place for them to be. But every month, we're sending money that the gospel might be shared with men and women who otherwise would not hear it. And so it's a difficult place. Uh, we don't even get to send out their emails. Like, we have to be really careful about that. But if you want more information about that couple and how you can pray for them, please come and find me or Claire or somebody on our staff, and we can fill you in on more of their details. Next year, we're going to be supporting Donnie and Rachel Todd, the Center for Mission Mobilization. You heard from him a couple of weeks ago, where basically uh, the... Mission is, is it's really hard, and so uh, one of the things that they're focusing on doing is sending indigenous missionaries who know the culture and the language, um, and basically mobilizing them to send them out as full-time missionaries to the people in their context. They don't have to get visas, and they don't have to move, right? They can live where they live, speak the language that they speak, but ultimately reach their people for the gospel. Then the one that's been near and dear to our hearts, you've heard Antonio Correa and he's come and preached for us a couple of times. It's Lego LBN Church in Guinari, Venezuela. And you know that times there are extraordinarily difficult economically. And so we as a church, we're able to support them. We send them $1,000 every month, and they're like, man, we're able to keep our building. And we have, you know, people that we can uh, pay to serve on staff and, and help with the needs of the people in our church because there's a church in Poto, Oklahoma that, that gives to them. Uh, but on top of that announcement... Um, a little over a year ago, um, God began stirring in Antonio's heart, and he and Danielle began to pray, and they've sensed over the last year that God is calling them to plant a church in Madrid, Spain. Um, there are about 200,000 Venezuelans that, due to the economic conditions there, they have fled Venezuela and now live in Spain, uh, many of those in the city of Madrid. And so, Antonio told me, he said, it doesn't make a ton of sense, but I think God's calling me to go and plant this church. And so they've begun to make preparations. There's a couple of guys who helped plant Lego LBN there in Guanare who are going to continue to serve and pastor that church. We're going to continue to support them, uh, but we're also going to support Antonio and Daniela as they go and begin to plant a church in Madrid, Spain. Now, here's the beauty of it. Um, because Antonio's father uh, was a Spanish citizen. Antonio has dual citizenship. They already happen to speak the language. And on top of that, they have about 20 church members, former church members of their church that are in Madrid that are going to go with them, to help, or not going to go, they're going to partner with them to plant this church in Madrid, Spain. And I'm just so excited to hear about what God's going to do, like how he's going to move. Uh, about 2% of the population of Spain are evangelical Christians, and so the gospel need there is profound, and we as a church are going to have the opportunity to support them, to stand behind them uh, down the road. Hopefully, we'll get to go and, and to visit and to participate with them in that mission work, but I'm just really, really excited that God would count us worthy of partnering with them in a mission like this. And so, uh, I want you to know that uh, corporately, we're doing a heck of a lot in terms of missions. Uh, we'll spend over $100,000 this year on various mission causes from local all the way to international. We're committed to spending at least 10% of our budget, putting that towards missions. And it's because God has called us to go to all the nations, making disciples of those men and those women who live in those places that we not, may not know their names or see their faces, but they need to hear the gospel. We need to teach them what it is to obey everything that Jesus has commanded us. And so today, um, 
I want to give you three ways that you can participate in our corporate missions. Um, not everyone can go every time. Um, there's some of these places that we aren't even allowed to visit. You know, it would cause issues for the missionaries. Uh, but how can we, as a body, how do we participate together? And what can be your role as we do missions together as a body? Uh, the first thing that I would ask you to do is to pray. Uh, we're going to kind of get everything changed over in our coffee bar. We try to advertise the various missionaries that we're supporting as much as we can there. And so would you take some time, we'll, we'll get the signs up here in the next few weeks, to go and read the stories of these missionaries and these people that we're supporting, um, and then just begin to pray for them. Would you ask God to strengthen them in the midst of their work? It is difficult, difficult work. There's a lot of stresses and sickness, and they need us to undergird them in prayer. There's a quote I love. Uh, um, it's by Thomas Brooks, and he says that you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you've prayed. And so uh, these men and women, they need us to be praying for them, praying that God would send out more laborers into the harvest field. We can pray that God would draw men and women unto himself, that they might be saved by the glorious grace of Jesus Christ, even in places where it's very difficult to believe. The, the second thing that you can do as um, a member of this body or someone who's connected to this church is that you can give. Um, I would just encourage you, um, if you're not already giving at least 10% of your income um, to fund the work of the church and missions around the world, would you pray about doing that? Just acknowledge that as a person who is, lives in the, one of the wealthiest nations that's ever existed, like we're we're in the top percentile of income earners in the history of the world, that you would set aside at least a tenth of your income to sow into God's kingdom and into his work. And so um, if you're unclear about how to give directly to missions through our church, we have two funds that you can give to. You can do this on the app. You can specify uh, either one of these designations or you can write it on your check. Um, the giving ministry is going to support the local things that we do, and that's where we help you know, foster kids and foster families or people that come in our doors that just have needs. Uh, that's the giving ministry. And so if you'll just, you know, hashtag giving uh, on your check or on the app, you can give directly to that. And the other fund that we use that sends missionaries abroad and across uh, North America uh, is the sending fund. And so that's hashtag sending. You can give that way too. Uh, but what this does, and Jesus tells us that ultimately um, where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. So if you want to get more involved in world or local missions, begin to send your money there. Now, um, I, I can't promise um, that you're going to get to see all of the fruit of what's going to happen. When we gave money to the, the church in Fetia, Turkey, we had no idea that there was going to be a man in Ukraine that was going to find himself in desperate need of a church and then it was all going to work out. We don't get to hear every story. But God takes the things that we give and it plants little seeds all across the world. And fruit is ultimately born. And so um, whether you see it or you don't, would you be faithful to give to support uh, the work uh, of missions uh, that doesn't happen directly through this church, but that we get to support corporately together? And then the final thing that I want to challenge you to do is that you would go. You would pray, you would give, and that you would go. Uh, we're going to go to West Virginia again next year, and it's going to be difficult Man, it's just a small price to pay to go and to be a part of the work that God is doing in that place. Uh, maybe it's not in West Virginia. Maybe you just go and volunteer at Second Chances here in our city. Maybe you sign up and uh, God's going to lead you to, you know, uh, to go to Spain with us in a few years or uh, anywhere that God might send us. But here would be my hope for you and hope for every one of us is that we just say, God, I trust you that you know more about me and about your work than I do. And so, God, wherever you're calling me, whatever you would have me do, the answer is yes. And so we just make ourselves available to God. Uh, we pray, and we give, and we go, and we trust the Lord to do His work through people like us, even though we're fallen and broken, that He would do His work to draw all the nations to Himself. Would you bow with me? Father, we do praise You. God, as I look at this list and see all of the ways that we get to be involved in mission, both as individuals, the personal stuff that we do right here in this city, and then that we get to be involved with corporately, God, we praise you. God, I'm not sure that I would pick me. 
But we're thankful that you involve us in your work in spite of our failures and our weakness. And God, we just pray that even if you would have us to give unto poverty and to serve till exhaustion, God, our answer would be yes to you because eternity hangs in the balance for us. So Lord, we pray that you would engage our heart in building your kingdom, expanding your kingdom. That we would be stirred with compassion for the people around us. God, that you would continue to use us in your redemptive work, both here and around the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.